Hey everyone, in this video we are going to talk about database applications. So a database application serves as an intermediary between the users and the database data, and this amount of distance that's provided by the database application is really helpful because if you have a database that you're managing, um, likely what that means is you have a lot of technical skill in order to actually manage that database. Um, there's probably a lot of very impor important information on that database as well, and you don't necessarily want anyone playing with it in just any old way. Um, a database management system like what we talked about before is a very powerful application when it comes to an actual database. It is able to do a lot of potential damage if used in the wrong way or by the wrong person. So you don't want to give your average user that amount of control and that's where the database applications actually come in. The database application essentially facilitates communication between the user and the database management system so that the user can, rather than actually changing the database, they can put in a request to do something to the database, maybe a request to add in a new row or a request to read certain things, and then the application will translate that request into a form that the database management system can read. It will then send it to the database management system. The database management system will decide if it's appropriate to do that. You know, is the does the user have the right permissions? Are they even allowed to access the database? Are they allowed to access this specific area of the database? Are they allowed to add new pieces of data and so forth? Um, then it will check if the request is actually valid. You know, does this table exist? Do these fields exist? All that kind of stuff. And then if everything is good, it will make that change and then update the result send that send whatever updated information uh, to the actual database application and the database application will display it for the user so rather than the user having to muck around in the database and possibly cause a lot of problems the database application both protects things and makes it a lot easier for the user it's able to reformat the database table data in order to make it more informative and easily updated. So it's a lot easier for the user to work with it. So there's four major elements of a database application. The first one is the form. The form allows the user to specify what they want to do. Do they want to view data, insert new data, update existing data, or delete existing data? The user will be able to specify it. They will put in that information into an actual form, a form with things like you know, fields where they can type in certain things. Um, yeah. So text boxes, buttons, all that kind of stuff. It will then collect that information that the user has put in, uh, kind of translate it into a format that the database management application is able to actually process and then send that request over. So the form is a way for the user to try to initiate an interaction with the database. The next element is the report. Uh, the report is a structured presentation of data and it often is created by sorting, grouping, filtering, filtering or other operations. And those operations might actually be relatively familiar. We were talking about them a little bit with Microsoft Excel, but we also talked about it in terms of structured data. And we were actually using Microsoft Access screenshots in those um, examples that we were working with, with the bike parts shop that was trying to figure out if they were you know, able to sell 3D printer uh, designs for specific parts if it was worth it for that. So they went through all those processes of sorting, grouping, filtering, all that kind of stuff. That would be um, 
and, and the, uh, the those are the operations that we're talking about in this case that a report is able to do in order to create a structured presentation of data. And we'll uh, go into some examples of what reports might look like in just a little bit. Queries in a database application are a search based on a data value provided by a user. So for example, you could, in the student table, in the example table that we've been looking at, um, you could query for a specific student number and get all of the information about that student as a result returned from you know, making that query. So the query is the actual search. Essentially what the application will do is it will let the management system know, hey, I am looking for an entry in your database that has this information in it. And the database will look for anything that matches that information and give all of that back uh, in, back to the database application, which will then display that information to the user. So if you're trying to look for a specific piece of information inside of a database, uh, that would be, you would make use of a query in your database application. And then finally, the application programs. This is a tricky one because you have database applications and then also database application programs and the textbook cautions that you should make sure not to confuse the two. They don't really say what the difference is. As best as I can tell, the database, the database application program is some sort of subroutine, some sort of program used by the application for the purposes of providing extra security, uh, data consistency, and special purpose processing. So it's some extra program that would check things like, is this user allowed to make these, um, you know, make these requests or something like that? Are they allowed to interact with the system? It would be another layer of security above what the database management system already provides. There's also things like checking for data consistency. So if the user is trying to insert new data into the database, it might check things like, do you have the right types of data in the right fields? For example, do you have the, um, when, when you are entering information in about a new student that has added the class, did you put an ID number in the ID number section or did you put their name in the ID number section? So it would be able to check and see, okay, this isn't an ID number, this is just text. So it can tell the error, the user, hey, there's an error here, You, this needs to be a number, an ID number, not an actual name. Something like that would make for data consistency. It would make the data consistent. You would know that all of the data is, you know, all of the ID numbers in your data are actually numbers rather than names or whatever other type of text there might be. And then special purpose processing is left relatively vague because it could be very different based on the actual purpose that you're working with. An example that the textbook gives regarding special purpose processing is uh, handling out of stock situations. So if you have a database that's keeping track of, you know, the inventory of a specific company, they're keeping track of what parts are in inventory or what uh, products in general are in inventory and how many of them are in inventory. Uh, a special purpose processing example could be handling an out of stock situation. So if a uh, order is made by a customer and the last part of, or the last uh, of a specific product is taken out of inventory and the database is updated and recognizes that, hey, this um, last 
uh, th this value is now zero. There are now zero um, of this item in stock. A uh, database application program might end up recognizing that this value is now zero and then raising an alert to whoever is in charge of inventory saying it's time to get more of this item because it is sold out as well as send maybe let's say a up a, a uh, notification to a web server that says display out of stock on this items page so that would be an example of a special purpose processing and there might be a lot more different types of programs that could do a lot more uh, different tasks all depending on what that purpose is and how like what it's supposed to do what uh what task it is supposed to do. So these application programs in particular will likely be using um, SQL to check, you know, different aspects of the database and then do something in response to some value having a certain value or some, you know, a new piece of data being added or all that kind of stuff. With data consistency, I want to talk about one more aspect of data consistency, which is that if multiple people are working on a database at the same time, you want to make sure that they are seeing the same piece of data, which is very, very important. You want to make sure that they both have the right information. And if they're trying to modify the same piece of data at the same time, making sure that the correct value actually gets uh, put in there at the end. And we'll talk a little bit about this more later, but data consistency in this case would be making sure that the data is consistent across what multiple users are doing and that the final re result should be what is expected. So traditionally, a database application would work a little bit like in this diagram. So what you would have is inside of a business they would have their own server and that server would contain the actual database itself and the database management system now that server could be accessed through the local business network not through the internet specifically through the local business network you would uh, have your computer plugged in to that local network where you could then access everything that is in that server and then use your application in order to do the work with the database that you needed to. Traditionally, that's how things would go. Now, I want to clarify that this isn't the case for single user databases. So Microsoft Access, which we talked about being a database management system, but which also functions as a database application in some ways, is meant to make single user databases uh, for the most part. And what happens when you use Microsoft Access in order to create your own database is that everything here, everything in this diagram, rather than taking place between the database server and the user's computers with separation being the actual organizational network, everything just takes place on the user's computer. And the database management system and database application are the same thing in the case of Microsoft Access, and it's just interacting with the database. So that's the kind of model that you will see when you're actually working with Microsoft Access. but. In the traditional case where you actually have a server and then a computer that is accessing the database on that server, uh, it would be different. You would have the computer connected to that server through the local organizational network, again, not through the internet, but through the local network, and the application would interface with the database management system. Now, in this case, a database application ends up being 
a uh, local, a locally installed app. Uh, so it's actually relatively heavy on the computer, at least compared to some of the other stuff that we'll see. But it's a application that is in full running on the user's computer. The user would be interacting with that application uh, as well as any other pe like applications that they are working with. That application would also have to be set up on their computer by the IT department. So in the case of using Microsoft Access, everybody would have to make sure that my, would have to make sure that uh, Microsoft Access is installed on every single computer that is in use in the building on top of all the other applications that are there. So it's the addition of another application that has to be installed on the computer. So you have just a full application that is uh, installed on every computer that is accessing the server. What's also of note here is that a database server in this traditional model is only hosting the database and running the database management system. So there's work being split between the user's computer and the actual database server, which would have been relatively important back in the day when computing power was much more expensive. If you have a database server with a lot of use, you would want as much power as possible being used to actually handle the database management system, especially if that's getting a lot of requests. Nowadays, uh, it's not so important to do that, and you would have plenty of spare power for other things, which we'll talk about some of those other things when we talk about other applications. But let's take a look at what some of the aspects of database traditional database applications look like. So this is an example of a form in a traditional application. Specifically, this is a uh, form in Microsoft Access, which uh, allows you to add new records to this student table, email table, and office visits table right here. And what we can see is that uh, this person is adding a new student to the class, uh, student number 1325. They're also adding in all the emails that the student sent, as well as all the office visits that this student made. And you'll notice that there's not every um, column shows up in the email and office visits table as actually show up in the tables themselves. And that's because this form allows for um, you know, making sure that you don't have to repeat that information. So because we're adding a student with the student number 1325 and the emails and office visits of that student, we know that the student number, you know, we only need to type the student number once. We don't need to type it once for the student table, once for the email table, and once for the office visit, a total of three times in one form. We just type it once and then it gets associated with every single table. As for the uh, email and office visits, uh, the email num and office, or, and the uh, office visit ID, I forget the exact field names, but if you remember from the databases video, those were uh, auto numbers. Those were automatically generated by access, so those aren't needed in here at all. Here's a quick reminder of what those uh, tables look like, by the way. Um, feel free to pause the video here. Okay, I'll move on. Now here's an example of a report that you might get from a traditional application. Uh, this is a report regarding the student um, with the student number 1325. Uh, it has all of their grades, their information, the emails, and you also have report information for another student with the number 1644. So you have this static report. It is a statically generated report. If you made changes to the 
a table or if you wanted to look at different information or something like that, you would have to get a new um, report made. So once this report is made, it is uh, relatively set in stone. Uh, if you wanted to get a updated report, you would have to make it make a new request and get a new report from that. And then here's an example of what a query might look like on a traditional application where you have just a window pop up that uh, gives you a search phrase and then the results that come from actually doing that search in this case. It's uh, Microsoft Access is looking for any rows with columns containing barriers to entry. Um, and it was able to come back with this uh, information right here. Uh, it was able to come back with the student name associated with this uh, office visit, the date of this office visit, and the notes regarding that office visit. And that's where the uh, keywords were actually found. So that's just what a query would look like on a traditional application. Nowadays, we tend to see more browser applications, and these are structured quite a bit differently. Um, you'll have the database server that actually holds the database and the database management system on it, and then you have a web server that actually provides the interface with which the users can access with the browsers and then make whatever requests and all that kind of stuff. So the web server hosts the application. It will host multiple instances of the application based on however many um, users are actually trying to work with it. And they will have the different programs running on that server that allow for you know, creating and showing the forms, uh, making the queries, generating the reports, all that kind of stuff. And what this does is this actually takes the load off of the user, the user's computer in particular, because they don't need to have a application that is running, uh, that is interfacing with a database server. They can just use their web browser in order to access everything. Now there's a few benefits to this method. Uh, for one, you know, because everything is being done through the internet, you don't actually necessarily have to keep your database server in the same building as your employees. Uh, this could mean a couple things. Uh, employees can access this, uh, you know, the web server database application stuff from anywhere. So if they're doing a work at home kind of thing, or if they're on a business trip or stuff like that, that wouldn't mean that they can't work with that uh, with those databases anymore. It means that they'll still be able to access them. It also means that the database server and the web server don't have to be physically on location in the office. The company might be able to rent server space from someone else in order to host their database and database, database management system which means that they don't have to buy a lot of really expensive computer hardware. They can just, you know, put it on someone else's hardware, pay them a monthly rental fee, and then have employees access uh, the application, which would then be able to communicate with the database management system. So those are some pretty nice benefits. It also makes things a lot simpler because that's one less application that has to be installed onto every employee's computer. Instead, they can just do everything through the web browser, which is becoming much, much, much more common nowadays. There's a couple of downsides. Um, one downside might be uh, server outages. If for whatever reason the uh, the actual web server goes down, you can no longer work with your database server or if the database server goes down as well. But that was something that we saw, you know, that that would be a possibility in the traditional uh, sense as well. 
This would be a problem, especially though, if these servers are located off site and especially if they're owned by another company, which means you have to wait for those companies to put everything back online before you can you continue to do your work. So that could be lost profit. Another huge, huge issue is security risks. Um, with everything being open to the internet, that means that it's a lot easier for someone to attempt to maliciously access these servers. Uh, whereas before, they would have had to actually be plugged into the office network, the office local network, in order to work with a database. Uh, now they are able to do that from anywhere and with any number of devices and any number of IP addresses, all that kind of stuff. So that can be a little bit tricky. It also means that any um, information passed from users to the database takes a little bit longer in order to actually happen. Um, and why that can be a problem is let's say two users, one here and one here, are trying to work with the same piece of data at the same time. Um, if user A up here has a faster connection and user B does not have a faster connection, user A can modify a piece of data that user B is currently working with without user B necessarily knowing. And then when user B writes those changes, user B might overwrite user A's changes. Uh, that is a the kind of problem that we'll get into in just a little bit. Um, I'll give an example of that kind of problem as well. All that being said, there is one more benefit that I'd like to talk about, which is that all the um, actual work that would have been done on a user's computer is now, or at least most of it, is being offloaded onto a web server right here. So the web server is actually running the bulk of the application and then serving results and taking input uh, from the user. So this means that users accessing this database don't really need to have that powerful of hardware, whereas um, a thick, if the application is particularly thick and they had to actually run it on their own machine, uh, that could necessitate more powerful computers for everyone who is working with that database, which is more money from the company. So it does save the company quite a bit of money that way. And I'll just say that the applications, applications coded in side of things uh, mostly just refers to uh, what applications are coded in depending on the sort of level that they are at. So an application that the user in this model is interacting with directly would be most likely coded in HTML5, CSS3, and JavaScript. HTML defines the structure of the web page that they're looking at. CSS3 defines how the web page looks and JavaScript defines the um, interactive functionality of the web page. On the other end of things, we have, uh, you know, the stuff like the, um, some of the support programs that might be running things like security or some of those special purposes that we talked about before. Those might be C Sharp or Java. You'll also see Python or C++. Uh, though that's not listed here. And then there's also Node.js JavaScript. Um, JavaScript was meant to initially just run on web servers, uh, but Node.js JavaScript allows JavaScript to run sort of as a full application. So you'll see a lot of that happening nowadays. But that's such all that means. You don't really need to remember that. Now I want to compare and contrast the forms that you might get between a traditional application and a browser application like this. And the reason why these look so different partially falls down to the nature of how they were made. These traditional applications, um, like we talked about before, are made in languages like C Sharp, Java, um, C++, Python, all that kind of stuff. And it's a little bit harder to make a nice looking interface in those languages. Whereas a browser application, this would be things like HTML, CSS, uh, JavaScript, and all of these have had uh, this type of interaction from 
close to the beginning, maybe not exactly the beginning, but forms have been a part of HTML and JavaScript for a very long time. So they've had a long um, period of being able to make this stuff work very well and look very clean. So when you have the stuff that looks very nice in terms of the user interface design, uh, a lot of the times that's a good sign that JavaScript and CSS and HTML are involved in some way. Um, now, I will say we talked about Node.js before. Node.js still takes advantage of HTML and CSS, so you might see a really nice looking computer application um, that might have been created by Node.js. It's the exact same technology, but websites tend to look a lot nicer than uh, interfaces that traditional applications make. And then you have the browser application report where because you are accessing this in your web browser, a lot of this stuff is a lot more interactable. Um, you don't just have a static product like we had in the traditional one, but you have all of these things that you can interact with. You can actually search different aspects of the report. You can click all of these icons to see all of these different things, all of these different contents. Um, you can look through all of these different tabs and everything can be generated on the fly from your data. So you can make the request and then the application and the database management system will work together to actually give you a report on the fly. You don't ever have to worry about something being out of date if you have a system set up like that. So that's a possibility under the browser, the web browser application model. In the end though, between the traditional uh, application and the browser application, it kind of ends up being similar in the sense that they both are interacting with the database server you know, the, the actual server computer. It's just a matter of what the actual application looks like, whether that is a program running on the user's computer or a program, a set of programs running on a web server that users are accessing through the internet. So the database server typically is the same all throughout. It's just a matter of the, whether or not the application is being run on a user's computer or on a web server, and then the user connects to that web server. Now, I want to talk about multi-user processing. So multiple users will often work on a database at the same time. Um, that's just, you know, multitasking or multiple people trying to learn different things from the same set of data or something like that. That should be totally fine. That is something that you should want to happen in a business sense because you want to make money as efficiently as possible. However, there are problems that can come from this. For example, the lost update problem, which I kind of alluded to before, but I want to give an example of right now. I'm going to talk about the example that the textbook gives. The problem that the book brings up is you have Andrea and Jeffrey who are both trying to get two tickets to an event. Andrea looks at the store page for those tickets what happens is uh, the web server sends a request to the database management system to pull how many um, tickets are available. The system returns that two are available. The web server, you know, the database application running on this web server uh, shows Andrea that there are two left. So she adds those tickets to the cart, but she doesn't check out yet. She gets distracted uh, talking to her friend about, you know, checking in and seeing if uh, her friend still wants to go to the, um, go to the event. In the meantime, while Andrea is talking to her friend, Jeffrey uh, goes on the website, sees how many tickets are left, sees that there are two tickets left because the web server pulls the database management system, which then returns that there are two left, and then Jeffrey immediately adds those tickets to the cart. 
So they both have the last two tickets left in their cart. Jeffrey checks out first. And the uh, Jeffrey checks out first. And then Andrea, soon after, checks out as well. So both of them have paid money for tickets that don't exist. Because... The web, the database management server said that both were available. I said that two were available, and because of that, they put two tickets in the cart. And then Jeffrey adds those tickets to the cart. The web server sets the uh, database stock ticket stock value to likely it would set it to two minus two is zero. And then Andrea checks out. There's nothing stopping her from checking out in place, and then that would likely set the database to zero minus two is negative two, uh, or something like that. That's one possibility of what could be happening on the back end of things. And this is a problem. This is the kind of problem that you have when users are concurrently accessing the database in different ways. They don't even know about each other. They don't know about each other's existence. They have no way of coordinating what they're accessing in the database and how they're accessing things and all that kind of stuff. They have no way of discussing this, and yet the database has to handle this so that things uh, can't go wrong. And there's a lot of different ways of doing this. We're not really going to go into it. The textbook briefly talks about how you could lock down that particular entry in the database so that no more changes to it can be made until Andrea resolves her thing. But like they said, there could be issues. For example, what if more tickets come in stock in the meantime, but they can't really update things in the database. So they're kind of stuck until Andrea finishes her conversation. If she finishes her conversation, she might just forget that the tickets are in the cart and just leave and then no one can ever change that again, that would be a huge issue. Uh, maybe as soon as Andrea adds the tickets to the cart, the database should have already been set to zero so that Jeffrey could, Jeffrey wouldn't even see that those tickets are there. But then Jeff, they lose a prospective customer, especially if Andrea removes the tickets from the cart. So there's a lot of different possible issues here. Maybe when Jeffrey ordered, it should have been set to zero. And then when Andrea ordered, the system should have checked again to make sure, you know, okay, is it still two? Are there still two tickets in here or are there less than two? And if there's less than two, uh, say that something went wrong with the order and that Andrea took too long and she should have ordered faster. But then, you know, if that's the case, what if the, what if the, in the time between checking and actually placing the order, Jeffrey actually placed his own. So on like Andrea's client sees that there's two as she's ordering, she clicks ordered Andrea's client checks to see if there are two Jeffrey clicks order sees checks to see if there are two Andrea's request comes back first and says, yes, there are two Jeffrey's then comes back and says, yes, there are two at the same time as Andrea's sets it to zero. And then Jeffrey sets it to zero as well, and they have cloned two tickets where, or they, they have made four tickets from where there were originally two, right? These are really, really complicated questions. These are the kinds of questions that they um, grill database programming students in computer science majors with. So there's a lot of really complex things here. I said we don't really have to get into it. I kind of talked about it a lot. We really don't have to get into it, but with multi-user processing, there are issues that, come, that can come up that you would have to be aware of in an environment where multi-user processing exists. So just something to be aware of. Regardless, this is the video on database applications.